Okay. All right. Okay. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Nightlord, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, blended threat management with um, specifically the, the Sonic Wall Security Plan. Um, blended threat can be taken one of two ways. Uh, the term, I don't, when I say it, people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, it can either mean uh, a malicious attacker that uses multiple methods to try to compromise the system you know, multiple aspects, using code and, you know, installing software on your system and all that stuff, that can be classified as a blended threat. And also, uh, malicious code that uses multiple methods of attack, you know, one piece of software that uses, you know, all types of different kinds of exploits to compromise your machine. And probably the most obvious is a worm, you know, in the modern sense, because they do, uh, they have little traits from all the different kinds of exploits, viruses and, and spyware and Trojan horses and all that stuff. So um, that's really what things are becoming because more attacks are getting more sophisticated as the security gets more sophisticated. <coughs> and, you know, most of the time, places, they have the layers of security on their network. So right off the perimeter of your internet connection, you usually have a firewall and then an intrusion detection system and then some form of antivirus, whether it's client antivirus or hardware-based, and then possibly spyware if it's just the freeware software or another hardware-based, and, and VPN sessions for security. Um, and you know, <coughs> they were mostly, you had one box for each thing, or you had a server that ran just the VPN or whatever. So you have these multiple layers that relied on each other for things to work correctly. And you usually have to learn you know, five or six different systems to be able to administer it. And especially if you're by yourself, then that's kind of a pain in the ass. And what a blended threat management solution is, is it's one box, one unit that has all that stuff in it. So when you're configuring it, you're looking at the same type of screen. You only have to learn one system and how it works. And most of the time, the software, because it's on the same system, it melts together real easily. And the rules can be traversed between the different systems. And there's a lot of them out there that are these all-in-one units. Um, they've started to spring up more and more within the last year. Um, WatchGuard makes one called Firebox. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, Cisco makes one. Um, Symantec makes one. McAfee makes one. You know, all the major um, antivirus places or security places make one of these. And I'm going to be talking about the Sonical. And the Sonical is the second highest selling security appliance. Um, right under Cisco. And, and they're a smaller company. I mean, they're big, but these are all over the place. And you may not even know it. So that's kind of the point in this, is if you ever get a chance to see something, you know what you're looking at. Because this is a little different. And the Sonic Wall is a unit. I mean, it's a rack-mountable unit that goes in your network. And it's, everything's hardware-based. And it runs an embedded operating system. And everything's proprietary, as far as I know. I'm sure that they use some kind of common processing, but I'm not, I don't know too much about the hardware. I know mostly the stuff about the software, which is what I'm going to be talking about. But it has, uh, it can be used as like an update manager for the client antivirus because there's a client antivirus that comes, that you can purchase to go along with the SonicWell system. And even if that computer is not connected to the internet, but it's still connected to your network, the SonicWell will still update it with antivirus because it handles all the updating for you. So as long as there's a connection, it knows um, where the, the different client software is, then it can update it. And it also has a, a really good logging system. And right out of the box, you get 10 VPN licenses, and you don't have to pay for any more. And that's without adding any of the security services. And this is what it looks like. When you log in as an administrator, this is the first screen you see, and this is the system status screen. And it gives you all the basic information that you want to see right off the cuff. It lets you check uh, the model, your serial number, your authentication code, what version of the firmware you're running, you know, all that stuff. It shows you what security services you have licensed because you have to license the security services. They don't just come with it. It also shows you the latest alerts. I think it's like the last five alerts on the logging system are displayed, so you can view those. And it also shows the state of your network interfaces because on the front of the unit, there's four interfaces 
one has to be the land, one has to be the WAN, and then there's two extra. And I'll talk about them in a minute. Okay, this is the network settings portion, because if you look, I'll go back, maybe, there. If you look on the side, you'll see all these bars. And these are different subsystems inside the unit. So you got your network settings, uh, your uh, wireless stuff, which is proprietary sonic point, that's really kind of nice to use, firewall, VoIP, VPN, users, failover, security services, and your logs. There's also a few basic wizards that are very helpful. There's only two of them, so. Anyway, the network, the system, is something you need to understand about the SonicWall operating system is there's two versions. There's the SonicWall OS standard, which you get when you buy the unit. That's the one that comes default, unless you're getting um, the 4060 or above. And if you get the OS enhanced, which is the best one, it's an object-oriented operating system for your, for your object, I'll say that. Um, you define all your devices in one spot, in one spot only. So all your rules that you set for your IPS or your firewall or routing, NAT policies, anything, uh, you only reference the object. So you don't have to worry about it being misconfigured in a million different places. So that makes it really nice. And, um, and everything's run that way. You can't make a rule in anything without having an object for it. That's just the building blocks of the system. And it's, that's the big hurdle with OS Enhanced. Um, a lot of people, when they buy these, they hear Enhanced, and SonicWall explains it to them, and it, it sounds really scary, the way they talk about it. But they don't describe it like this, which is what it is. So if you know anything about programming, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is the network. When you click on the network tab, it takes you into the interfaces section. And this just shows you your interfaces. And this is what I was talking about. You have four interfaces. With the OS standard, you only get to use three. You can only use three. And with the OS enhanced, you can use all four. And with that, you can have two separate internet connections acting as one, which is what we have here. Because you'll notice X1 and X2 are both WAN ports. We have two DSL connections connected in that run load balancing. So the bandwidth isn't so intensive. And uh, you also can use the third or the fourth port um, for uh, DMZ and a few other things that you don't necessarily want to attach to your network. You can also, um, it'll show if you have um, sonic points on here, it'll show an added interface, a virtual interface, if you have uh, a wireless network. Here's the, the failover, which is right below the interfaces. And this is, it shows you the primary and the secondary that are assigned. And so it's X1 and X2. And you have to enable the load balancing. And there's a few options. You can either do the basic active passive failover, which is just failover, it's not load ban balancing. So if X1 <coughs> goes out, then it automatically routes all the bandwidth to X2. But other than that, it doesn't use them both, it only uses one. And then the per connection round robin, is a good basic one. It doesn't take a lot of configuration, and it, it just, it's, it can tell when one port's being used, so it'll just send it on the other one. And then the, the communication comes back on that same port. So you don't have to worry about spilling over in the sonic wall, uh, passing the packets down a different pipeline. And then the next is the spillover base, and you can say how many kilobytes you want to allow on the primary, and then once it gets over that, then it throws it on the secondary. And then there's the percentage base, which obviously you put a percentage of what traffic. So if you have a faster connection for your primary, then you want to send more traffic down that because you can. So that's that. And then you can also do um, monitoring. <clears throat> and by default, it checks the WAN status every five seconds. So it'll, it'll alert you and it'll activate the load balancing or the failover. And, and with all these other, the load balancing, that's automatic failover too. It automatically becomes, if one goes down, everything automatically shifts to the other one. And this is the address objects. And this is where the op object -oriented, oriented stuff comes in right here, is you have to define all your, and ours is really simple, but down here you'll notice that one through 12 are, you can't, do anything with them. Those are the standard ones that come with the system. They don't allow you to edit it. But you can make more just by clicking add. But we have three down here that we added, and we have three subnets on the network, and then a router that handles all the packet switching. And we created objects for that so we can state 
um, in our routing policy where we want stuff to go. So we only have to configure it here. And then for every other rule we apply, we just reference that object. And when you add an object, this is what it looks like. You give it a name, which means nothing. And then a zone assignment. So you know those are pretty obvious what those are. And then you select the type. It can either be a host range, a network, or a MAC. So one unit, a range of units, a whole network, or just one hardware MAC address. And, uh, and then you just throw in the IP address, or the range, or whatever and then your object's made. And this is the routing, and you'll notice here, four and five, this is what I was talking about, the special rules that we made in our routing to go to the separate networks. So we reference that, that is the one object, and there is the gateway, which is the other object that we created. <coughs> and uh, I skipped over the, there's a DHCP section, but the page is nothing but the configure button, so I didn't put it on here. Once you hit configure, this is where it takes you, and it's just like any other DHCP. But it's the, th the thing that's nice about it is since it's included, all the rules, if you're giving it by name, it, it knows where everything is, and it does dynamic DNS. So um, it's, if you use DHCP and you don't have a DHCP server, like you're running a router that's got DHCP, you, know, you just use this, and it'll accomplish the same thing. But it's pretty simple, you know, start and all that. So and then the DNS settings and the Win server settings. Okay, now the firewall, it's just like any other firewall. I mean, it's got all the access rules, and you, you, know, you put everything with the objects, because all of these on, on the objects page that I show you, you'll notice that the LAN, WAN, and all that stuff is an interface, and it's an object, it's another object. So when you're doing all your firewall rules, you reference the object. And um, the only one, because we don't have any special firewall rules, because by default, this thing comes out of the box really secure. I mean, it's got everything off. So the only one they give you to edit is your LAN to WAN, so your internet connection. And the reason why that is, the main reason, is because you can put a schedule on it. And you can say you can only get internet traffic between this time and this time. And that's what that little clock means, because we have it scheduled for work hours only. So people, because we, we run a manufacturing plant that's got three shifts, and we don't want somebody, because there's no supervision at night, and get on the internet and doing stupid stuff. So <clears throat> this is how you add a rule. It, you know, it's the same as everything else. It references the objects. You pick your from and to zone, so that would be your WAN to WAN, WAN to LAN, you know, vice, you know, everything else. And then your service, and there's a service tab um, for all the different applications you run that need to get through the firewall. So if you're running AIM or something like that, uh, you can create a rule for that. Um, and then your source and destination, how many users are allowed. And you can also set a schedule for this as well. <coughs> uh, for any other object or uh, access rule that you do, you can set a schedule. And then you can enable logging. And that will automatically flag your log. So it knows it's been trying to bend a compromise or denied something. Okay, now this is the fun stuff because everything up to this point has been really, I mean, it's, it's a firewall. You know, it's a router. It's nothing really that fancy. Um, it, it processes stuff quickly, and it works well together, but you know, that's not what makes the sonic wall good. I mean, this is the stuff that really does it, and this is the security services that are built in. And this is all the extra stuff, content filtering, antivirus, intrusion prevention, spyware, email filtering, and uh, real-time blacklist mirroring. And, um, when you go into the section, you automatically come up to the summary, which shows you every security service available and whether it's licensed or not, and if there's an expiration date on it, because it's a, by subscription, it'll give you the expiration date, so you know when you have to renew. Uh, the security services, I already said them, include all that stuff, and they all work together, just like everything else does. The content filter is, is fully customizable. You can, uh, just like any other content filter, you can put custom URLs that you want to allow or not allow, things like that. But there's the way, the real way that this thing runs is by categories. And SonicWall comes up with the categories for you, which is kind of a pain. Because a lot, well, like I said, we work in a manufacturing shop and we have a quality lab. And they were trying to look up some gauge or something, and it came back saying it was porn which it wasn't. 
So they're not always right, but it makes it real easy to, um, because it's based on groups, if you know the purchasing department should be buying something, but you know another one should not, you can turn on the, the retail category just for that group and leave it off for everybody else. And it includes a sign-on system um, that makes you uh, do an agreement. Like you can sign, when you try to go to the internet, because it's the gateway and it has the content filtering set up, it, it automatically shows you a page that's loaded inside of the Sonic while it hosts it, right inside of there. And you have to sign on with your user that you build inside the Sonic wall, and then you get an agreement page. And the only real reason I can ever see this being used is if you're in like a public place, you know, you got public access, but you, uh, you know, want them to sign a waiver, you know, that they're not responsible if you do anything stupid or something like that. That's the only way I can really see that working because you're just agreeing to use the internet. So I don't know why you would use it in a, a business sense at all, but, and you can also filter web features, which is like ActiveX or Java or anything like that. This is the content filtering tab. And it's pretty basic. You got your configure and your standard um, filter set, which is the SonicWell CFS. Then you got what I was talking about, the web filters. You can say with a check that a lot or that um, denies it. So you can deny ActiveX, Java, cookies, proxy servers, and uh, fraudulent certificates. And you can also, this can throw you off because when you see trusted domains, you think they're allowed to go through. But that's not what that's talking about. That's only for the web features. So if you have a domain that's in the trusted domains because you want it to be able to use ActiveX, but it meets a category in your CFS, then um, it won't let it through. So when you click on configure, it takes you into here. And uh, you just say, if the, if the server's down, you can allow the traffic to all websites or deny it. So you know if it goes down, uh, your network goes down or whatever, and uh, you have some other means of communication, then it'll deny things. And uh, you can also set forbidden URLs and set it to block it, which kind of doesn't make any sense why you would have an optional not block on a forbid list, but whatever. And then you can log access to the URL, which is really nice because if you want to see if somebody's going to stuff that they're not supposed to, it'll give you all their information that's in the log, which I'll show you later and you can see what URL they were trying to go to and when. And your cache size, because it holds all the raw files and then exports them to the log or to the viewpoint system, and it stores it all in internal memory. So you can, there's a lot of memory in it. I don't know the amount right off the top of my head, but that's the default. So it apparently has at least that much. And I just left it at the default because I think it can hold, it can hold a lot. I, we've never had to worry about it, so. Um, and then the next one is the policy where you define the categories and I actually forgot to put that in but the cool thing about it is they don't just block the bad stuff they block the good stuff too I mean stuff that's work related kind of stuff you can block children's sites you can block um, sports restaurants uh, hotel reservations travel um, and you can block like everything you can and then there's even a category for Uncategorized stuff, you can block that. So you could totally shut the internet off and still have the internet, so. Now the gateway antivirus, it's, it's hardware based, so it's your hardware antivirus. Every packet that comes in is scanned at the box. And the big selling point for the Sonic Wall, at least to them, is they use, uh, their term is deep packet inspection, which is different than stateful packet, because it breaks down the packets and looks at every single bit every single one with like no latency to you. you. It's almost totally transparent. I mean, we're talking like milliseconds maybe between the packets getting there, being unpacked, looked at, packed back together and sent to you. You don't even notice. And uh, it's signature based and the antivirus updates itself every five minutes. I thought it was five seconds, but that's <laughs> a lot. So I, I checked and it's every five minutes it updates itself or it checks for an update. Now, there isn't always an update every five minutes, but it checks for one every five minutes. So you are up to date, like right now, you know. 
Um, and it's just like everything else, you can customize it with special rules. You can actually allow viruses to come in, like certain ones, if you want. I don't know why, but uh, this is the main screen for the antivirus. Um, it shows you where your status is. Uh, you can manually update. And then it also, you can scan only certain protocols. Like if you want to leave FTP out of it, then you do. And you can do that, and you can do that with all of them. Now, at the bottom, you'll see it'll, it'll enable outbound inspection, which will it'll, it'll inspect the outbound traffic. Um, SMTP is the only one you can turn off. Because you, you think that they would be on by default for inbound and not outbound, but they're actually on by default, and you can't even edit that for outbound. But you can say, don't scan things in. And then to configure it, you just go to configure. And this is a small portion of the list. So if you know, you've heard of a virus that's out there that you want to know if uh, you have a signature for it, you can scan through the list. It's all in alphabetical order. So you just go to the list and you then, if it's not there and it's something bad, then you can prepare for that because you know that you're not protected. And when you hit configure, this is all it is. Uh, you can enable client notifications. So if they have the client version, it'll let you know uh, if a virus tried to go to your PC and the, and the gateway caught it. Now, I, I suggest not ever using the client because it is completely pointless. Because if you have the gateway and the client using the same signatures, then there's no added defense. I mean, you're just putting something else there. You need to use another third-party provider so you have, you know you're getting your signatures from two different places. And like I said, you can enable an exclusion list. And also this one I should point out, the test virus, SonicWell actually uses these to make sure that their signature works and they randomly pick a device just to test it on. So they say, you know, try to keep that on um, just in case we hit your box for whatever reason, so we just left it on. The intrusion prevention system is pretty cool. It's signature based, but it's actually the signatures are from Snort. So it's supported a lot of the signatures in here are from the open source open source community now sonicwell does do their own which they don't release but a lot of them majority of them are from snort and uh customizable it updates itself every five minutes all the stuff that needs updates it updates itself every five minutes and it also does the same deep packet analysis and you can um, trigger logs by severity level you see right here uh, there's a severity level, low, medium, and high, and uh, you can prevent and detect and turn that off or on, depending. We have the low priority attacks off because the low priority stuff is really stupid stuff that doesn't mean anything, but it fills up your logs like crazy. And if you, if you deny, if you don't do the prevent, then it doesn't um, stop it, and if you don't do the detect, then it doesn't log it. If you do the detect, then it automatically logs it, so you got to do both of them off. Or you can do prevent, but it still automatically logs it. So, um, But to configure it, oh yeah, the, the log redundancy filter as well. Um, if something's trying to get to your system, you know, it's not going to just do it once and then quit. It's going to try it multiple times. Well, it's not filling up your logs. It'll, it'll say, tried it this time, and then it'll wait 240 seconds before it logs the attempt again from the same interface or from the same source. When you hit configure, this is where it takes you. you it, it can do, in, or it checksums everything. If you, uh, and you can turn on to prevent invalid and detect. And it does the same thing as the prior, the detect logs it, but doesn't prevent it, the prevent logs it and prevents it. And uh, IP reassembly, we didn't really know what it was, but last night we thought we figured out what reassembly is. And for the IPS, we think, that the individual packets might not be enough to detect a lot of the signatures. So it reassembles the whole packet or the whole section to be able to scan through the whole thing. That's what we think IP reassembly means, but I'm not sure. Um, and you can enable that and also an exclusion list. And a lot of stuff is, it says to be it, that it's an intrusion, but it's really not. You know, you have something that is supposed to do something, but this is blocking it, you know. And that would come up more often than anything else. The anti-spyware um, is just like the antivirus, but it uses spyware signatures. 
and uh, it, it, you can, everything triggers a log and you can set it to trigger an email. So if something comes through, um, you can get email notification and just throw it on the log. Because this is like, Sonicwell was one of the first companies to come up with um, hardware-based spyware detection. So this is it. Just prevent, detect the same. Everything looks the same. It can also do just the, the different protocols and hit configure and it configures it. And this is where it takes you. Looks like everything else. You know, but you'll notice that every, all this stuff is common, but they're completely different systems. They do completely different things. So you know, you know one section and you can use them all because it's that easy to work with. And the email attachments and, and real-time blacklists uh, are you know, common things that you can filter out certain extensions for your email. So if you don't want people to receive executable attachments, you can take them off and then it'll throw a warning message on the bottom of the email saying that it was taken off and that they need to contact whoever. And the real-time blacklist is you can use your own blacklist server or you can mirror other servers and it automatically updates itself every five minutes. And um, there's the email filter, real basic and the real-time blacklist, and you'll see we got mirrors. OK, logging and viewpoint. Um, the logging system is, is really good. It, it, show, it collects everything. You can see all the data besides the actual packet on the log and know exactly where it's coming from, what their MAC address is, all that stuff. And uh, if you have viewpoint, which is another security or another service that you can purchase, It'll convert all the raw logs into really nice charts and graphs that you can give the higher up people that may not know what the heck they're looking at. And it makes it real easy to just reference. You can see who's burning up all the bandwidth or checking their email a million times or whatever. Um, this is the log. This is what the log looks like. So it shows you know, what time, uh, what category it was, the, any messages, source, destination, notes. It shows the MAC address. There's a MAC address right there. And like this was a website access denied and it shows you the website they were trying to access and what category it fell under. And viewpoint is the thing that makes everything look all pretty. But this is the bad part. This is the only bad part of this, the whole system. Um, the password is uh, hashed inside the machine, but it's not on the box. It's on an XP machine. So it's the only thing that sits outside of the sonic wall. And it's the weakest link in the system because it's built on a system with known vulnerabilities. You can't install it on anything other than Windows XP. Or I think you can do it on Server 2003, but I'm not 100%. But it uses Tomcat, which has had flaws, Windows XP, and it's based on TCP IP. So you know, you've got all that stuff that has known vulnerabilities, but you may be thinking, who cares? It's a logging system. Well. The problem is, from the main screen of the viewpoint, you can log into the Sonic Wall as administrator without using a username and password. You can have full access to the box without ever knowing the username and password, which is really bad. Um, this is viewpoint, and right there is the login button. You hit that button, and it'll come back, and it'll say your certificates don't match. Do you want to proceed anyway? You click yes, and you're an administrator. Now you have full access to the entire network. You can do whatever you want just because they don't ask you to put in your username and password. I mean, that is stupid. And if any of you have read my 2600 article about this, that was the point. I got a lash back from SonicWell saying, how the hell did you get the password? You can't do that. That's not the point. That's not the point of the article. And if you thought that was the point, then you missed the whole thing. That is the point. It doesn't matter how you got it. You exploit the box. You can use you know, a key logger is the easiest way. And the other problem is you can't change the administrator login name. It's got to be admin. So all you got to do is sift through the logs from the key logger, look for admin, look for a little string, and you have the password more than likely. So then you just log into this, log into the box, and, and you have free reign. So that's that. I'm going to kind of, I don't know what time is it. Anybody have the time? How long am I running? Okay. All right, good deal. Okay, so I can kind of take my time then. 
This is kind of the, this is the viewpoint. So I want you to know what it is that this really does. And everything is one of these scatter charts. I don't have any of the other stuff, but you can do bar graphs, pie charts. Um, I, can't, I don't know what they're called, but you know, they got four different axes, or two different axes, or four, yeah, four different axes where it's running. And uh, it just makes everything pretty. And this one is the, uh, the bandwidth. So you can see when the bandwidth jumps, lunchtime. Jumped right up to the top, that's the highest. And uh, it'll give you, um, you can go, there's more pages if you click that little arrow over there, which is kind of hard to find, but right up there. You can go to the next page and see <coughs> all the, the times and the percentage of the bandwidth used for that day um, where it falls. Oh, and you can do by user, and you can see who's using the most. And uh, if there isn't a user defined in the system, it automatically uses the NetBIOS name of the PC. Um, so you know, you know, if you use good description, you know who's really doing it. They don't necessarily have to have a user. And you can do over time, which is a span of time, um, and by user over time, which is a span over time according to the, you know, who's using the most. So um, the ROI is kind of nice if you have people that want to know if they're making their money. I don't know if this is reliable at all because I don't really care. I just use the thing. But, you know, they calculate how much cost it is uh, per megabyte. And you can give this to your um, CIO and be like, see, it's worth what we paid for it, which is a lot of money. But I don't, you know, they came up with it, so it's probably not right. But same thing over time, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is kind of cool. This will show you all the services that are running, that have been running on your network. So you can go down the list and see by colors whether people are using IRC and they're not supposed to, or instant messaging. Or, um, and it also shows you the amount of megabits per protocol. So you see HTTP is at the top, and then POP3 is right below that, and then SMTP is right below that, so internet and email. There's a little FTP there that our virus scanner uses, and HTTPS management. <coughs> and uh, uh, what's this one? The web usage. So this is who's on the internet the most. This is kind of nice, because they may be using a lot of bandwidth, but they might not necessarily be using the internet. So if you want to just know who's, using, who's on the internet all the time, you can just look at this log and it'll show you and it's broken down. This has got the most options for different uh, ways to view the data. It's got quite a few and you can base it on user sites, the top sites that are accessed every day, um, over time and all that fun stuff. The next one is uh, browse time. So now you can see who's actually by time because the other one's by megabits. So who's gotten the most megabits from the web is that. And this is browse time for the actual browser that they're using. So you can see if they're on for three, four, five hours a day. And uh, what's this one? This is the web filter. And this is kind of cool too. You can see who's trying to access stuff they're not supposed to and how much and what. It'll show you the category and where it falls. If you look down here, there's, uh, there's one by, by category or something like that that you can view. There's the next one is FTP usage. And right here, see how there's this giant spike? Every morning, our antivirus uses FTP to update um, its signatures on our client system. So right in the morning, you can see when everybody's coming in, it's jumping up and getting the updates first thing. And then it kind of trickles off. And it'll show you um, how many instances at what time. Uh, mail usage, so email usage, that's pretty self-explanatory. Most of these are. I skipped over VPN because we didn't have any VPN when I actually put this together. But I just recently set up the VPN. And the VPN does the same thing. It just shows you how long the tunnels were active and where they were coming from. Because the VPN settings have to be associated with a user or a group. And you can see who is using it and all that. And MAC address and IP address and all that. <coughs> uh, the attacks. This will show you, this is a summary of all the attacks, all the virus attacks, the spyware attacks, intrusion prevention attacks, it shows them all, a uh, summary of everything. And uh, there really isn't anything, like you see this huge spike, 
But if you look down at here, like there's not that much. So that's, uh, you can get it over time and all that stuff and, and see when, what time, who's getting the most attacks, the destination. Um, the virus attacks, this breaks it down into just viruses. So you know how many different viruses at what time we're trying to hit. The next one is the intrusion. So you can see when the intrusion, it just pulls it out of the main attack so you can look at it by different, the different things. And uh, that's really it. The, I mean, blended threats are the way everything's going. So why have a million things sitting on your rack when you can have one with one system to manage it one way? Um, it's really easy to throw in right out the box. You take it out, you have to direct connect it to another PC, change your IP address to something, go in, change the pat username and password, change that IP address, and then just replace your gateway, and everything works right off the bat. Um, you saw the functions and the security services that are in it. The only thing I suggest is not doing viewpoint, if you can get away with it, at least for right now. I, I've talked to Sonicwell, and they said that they're going to try to fix that. So maybe the next version, you know, you'll be able to get to the link to the interface, the web interface for the Sonicwell, but you'll still have to put in the admin password and able to be able to go in. So hopefully they do that because that's really bad. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead. You mentioned earlier in the presentation that they use uh, snort signatures. Do they credit any other open, open source projects? No. Nope. And they don't even credit it in their documentation. Like if you go to their manuals, and you can, all their manuals are available on the web. If you just go to their site, you can get the manuals for the entire system. For every different security service and everything, you can get the whole manual, which they're really good manuals, but they don't attribute it to snort. The only reason I know that it uses snort is because before we bought this thing, the reason why we bought it is we went to a presentation. You know, the company came down, and, and they told us that it was Snort. That's the only reason why I know. But they don't reference it anywhere else. So that's kind of bogus. But. You know, well, I guess you probably know. Um, so I was going to say, like, if they use any part of the Snort engine, and, like, you remember, I guess... They no, I don't think they do. I, I think they reference that a little. I, all their software, I think they wrote it all themselves. Okay. I don't think they actually took anything from Snort but I think they just use their signature structure. Um, so. Another question I have is, what are some things that this can do over like, just enough time in Linux and other open source software? You know, like if I have enough time, from what you've shown me, I could build all that functionality using Linux and other open source yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, but like, is there anything that that can do that, that's not available in the open source community right now that you know? Well, the difference is because the software it's still running on your disk. You know, it's still software. And this is, it's a little different the way that it works because the hardware was designed specifically for the software. So it operates better with each other. There's not any conflict. And I know, uh, I mean, you can set one up in Linux. And if you know how to do that, then do it. You know, don't spend the money. But, you know, this is enterprise level stuff. And if people don't want to mess around with trying to do all that and want something that's going to last and that has warranties and blah, 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 you know, this is the way to go over just buying like a firewall and throwing it in. That's, that's really the point. Yeah, but yeah, you could build a Linux box that does all that same stuff, so. Go ahead. What's the cost on that? I mean, is it something that only a company would afford? Is it like? Well, you can get the small, there's, there's a bunch of different versions. If I have a small off of like, you know, 10. Yeah, you can get, it's called the TZ170. And it's the smallest version, and there's two, there's two different models. Well, actually, there's three different models. Um, one is the, uh, the standard one, which is the lowest cost, which is under $1,000, is uh, only 10 nodes. But you can load the OS Enhanced and every single service on it. And that's the way it goes for all of them. <clears throat> Everything is exactly the same. It's just the processing, processing power and how many clients it can handle at one time. And the TZ170, like I said, is under $100, but, or under $1,000. But the problem is the services are still really expensive. So for the hardware, you know, you can buy a TZ170, and, you know, it's, it's, I think it might be 700 bucks, And you get the firewall and all that stuff stock in the operating system, but you don't get any of the security services. But the services themselves cost a lot. That's really where they make their money. Because even the, <clears throat> the 2040 in 2004, won an award, 
for being like the best security appliance from one of the big uh, network or security magazines. And uh, that, the box itself is only $2,000. And that's the one throughout my talk, <clears throat> that was a 2040 that I was using. The software was off the 2040. And you can get, it goes all the way up to 5060, which the difference with that one is it has OS enhanced on it. 4060 and 5060 have enhanced on it by default and it's got a gigabit port. So, um, but the services, I can't remember the amount, but like you have to buy the intrusion prevention, the anti-spyware and the, um, the web or the email filtering as one package, but they're separate services. And then everything else you can purchase separately. But everything, nothing, there's nothing less than $1,000 in there, so. With the subscriptions that you're talking about, like how, like what kind of price ranges are those for like the, is it monthly or yearly? yearly. It's yearly. a yearly fee. You it's pay like $1,000 like a year or so for services? Yeah, yeah. You can buy multiple years at a time and get a discount, but it's, it's an annual fee, so. Got another one? What's up? Uh, yeah, like if I didn't want to use like signature-based antivirus stuff, and like I wanted to write a module to use like heuristics, how easy is like? Do they provide any information on writing plugins? Or no, anything? you can't. You can't. There's no you. They won't let you in any of it. It's 100% proprietary. You can't add anything to it unless they do it for you. But they're actually pretty cool about calling them and like saying that I would like to have this, and then they'll do it. Because we actually requested that they make it uh, able to um, do the, the group, the category groups with the content filtering and they did it. They said they had a couple other requests for it, but we were only like the third company that requested it and they did it. It was in their new version. So, I mean, they will add that stuff for you if it's within reason to them. I'm sure they won't add that in there because then they're losing out on money and you know, they're all about money, but any other questions? <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, no, I worked in an enterprise environment doing security stuff. Um, one other part that I dealt with was doing forensics and like if we had to prosecute like employees and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And you mentioned about the logging. Mm -hmm. Like, how is their logging set up? Like, is it logging the data like to the box, or can you set it up? For yeah. Well, remote, you can. Like, it'll log to the box. It'll log to the box and it saves it as a file. It'll email you that file. You can set it to email it, and it emails it as a text file, and then you can save it. And you can also download the logs manually by going to the logging section and then there's a button to download the logs and it'll download it to your PC. So you can store all your logs. And you can also state you know, how long, so you can get, uh, I think we have ours set for 15 days. It keeps the raw logs 15 days inside the box before it automatically sends them or deletes them or overwrites them. I think it overwrites them. It doesn't just delete them. So it, you know, it, the next entry, it just overwrites the first entry. So any other questions? Yeah, you, you had said that they, uh, Sonic Wall actually, you had uh, one of the options checked where they could test against vulnerabilities or whatever on your box. Yeah. Like now, how, how often is like that, you have a chance of something like that happening? I mean, oh, are they like mucking with your box slim. a lot or? It's slim because uh, there's so many of these out there. And they have units, you know, they pretty much know. The guy said that they don't, they don't do it very often, but if they have to, then just leave it open. Yeah, they tell you. Yeah, they tell you. They'll let you know. Yeah, no, no. They're not just messing with your stuff while you're... Because they can't. All they're doing is sending a virus your way. You know, that's it. Um, I talked to them, and there isn't any backdoors to it for the company. So you have to give them your username and password if you need them to remotely administer it. They can't just get in. So Anything else? No? Okay. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, low Tech has tickets. And if you thought it was cool, then go get a ticket from Low Tech. And you get a prize at the end of the con, so.